Greetings. I am Nitish Mukhopadhyay, Professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut Stores. Welcome to this series, The Films of Distinguished Statisticians. This is a joint program of Pfizer Global Research and Development, the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut Stores, and the American Statistical Association. The funding helps us to invite the most distinguished statistical scientists to our university. It also allows us to film the Pfizer colloquia and conversations for the archive of the American Statistical Association. Before we begin this segment, conversations with distinguished statisticians in this series, with deep gratitude, let me mention two colleagues, late Professor Harry Poston and Dr. David Salzberg. Late Professor Poston and Dr. Salzberg engineered this program more than 33 years ago. The first film in this series was launched in 1978. I feel proud to dedicate a conversation with Professor Steve Feinberg in memory of Professor Poston. I'm delighted that Dr. Myron Straff from the National Academy of Sciences, Washington, D.C., and Professor Judy Tanner from SUNY Stony Brook, New York, would participate in a conversation with Professor Steve Feinberg about his life and work. And now, it is my great pleasure to invite Dr. Myron Straff to take over the proceedings. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Myron Straff with the Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education at the National Academies in Washington, D.C. With me is Judy Tanner, Professor Emerita from the Department of Sociology at Stony Brook University. We're here today to honor Professor Steven Feinberg of Carnegie Mellon University, part of a series of conversations with distinguished statisticians in memory of Professor Harry O. Poston. Support has been provided for this series by Pfizer Global Research here in Connecticut, the American Statistical Association, and the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut here. Professor Feinberg is the Maurice Falk University Professor of Statistics and Social Science at Carnegie Mellon. He is renowned for his many contributions to statistical methods that have had a profound impact, not only upon statistical theory, but also on scientific discovery in many other fields. We're indeed honored to have him here today, and so let me start this conversation off. Steve, how is it that you became a statistician? Funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually a somewhat long story because when I was in high school and entering university, I didn't know that there was such a field. Um, I was uh, excelling in mathematics, and when I went to the University of Toronto, which was in my hometown, that's where you went if you could get in, um, I enrolled in a course called Mathematics, Physics, and Chemistry. Um, it was one of the elite courses. and. Over the course of the first year, as I went through my chemistry labs and never succeeded in getting the right result when I mixed the chemicals up in the beakers, I realized chemistry wasn't for me. And so the second year, I did only math and physics. Um, and then there were the physics labs. And I could never quite get the apparatus right to work to get the answer that I knew I was supposed to get, I still got an A in the physics lab because I could start with the result and work backwards and figure out what the settings were and things like that. And it was clear physics wasn't for me as a consequence. So that left me with mathematics. And it was in the second year that we had a course in probability. So I was being gently introduced to these ideas. And then in my third year, there was a course in statistics taught by Don Fraser. And he was terrific. Uh, it was a revelation because I didn't know anything about it coming in. And he did probability theory. He brought into play geometric thinking. And when he got to inference, it was like magic. 
Of course, in those days, Gon did what was called fiducial inference. He called it invariance theory. But you went suddenly from statements about probability to probability statements about the data. And I recall the old cartoon that, that people like to reproduce of the two scientists pointing to a blackboard full of equations and one of them points to an equal sign and he says, and a miracle suddenly occurs here. That's sort of what Don's class was like. He was a great lecturer. Uh, he was friends with the students. And it was very clear that this was a really neat thing to do. And so in my fourth year, I took three classes and uh, applied to graduate school. So it was mathematics by elimination and statistics by revelation. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. So you applied to graduate school. And where did you apply and where did you end up going? Well, um, at the University of Toronto, through this course, there had actually been many people go into statistics. Don Fraser mm -hmm. had come out of it, Ralph Wormlight, and David Brillinger. Oh, yes. The year before me, uh, and they all went, by the way, to Princeton. Uh, the year before me, there was John Chambers. And John had gone to Harvard. And so I knew John, and I asked him how it was at Harvard. And so I did apply to Harvard. I also applied to Princeton. And um, in their wisdom, they didn't think that I should carry on the tradition from the University of Toronto. And that made the decision easy. <laughs> I went to Harvard. <laughs> when you, you, by the time you, you went to Harvard, you were already married. Is that right? No. I, I had met my wife, Joyce, at the University of Toronto when we were both undergraduates. I was actually working one fall in the registrar's office. And on the first day the registrar's office opened to enroll people, Joyce came through. And um, one of the neat things about working in the registrar's office, besides earning some cash to spend, was I was meeting all these beautiful young women. And so Joyce got immediately entered into my little book of people that I was going to plan to date. The next day she came through again, this time bringing through uh, another young woman who turned out to be the daughter of friends of her parents. And I thought this was a little suspicious, but auspicious in the sense <laughs> that maybe I'd succeed in getting a date. And the next day, she came again, this time with her cousin. <laughs> and then I knew that this was really good work. <laughs> um, and we got engaged at the end of the summer after I graduated. But we weren't married when I went away to graduate school. In fact, yesterday, I was talking to one of the students at the University of Connecticut who was a little concerned about graduate school. It was wearing her down. And I told her I almost left after the first semester because I wasn't sure I was going to make a go of it. Um, but I did. <laughs> and Joyce came at the end of the first year. We, we got married right after um, the classes ended. And um, we've been together ever since. And where were your children born? Where? Ah conceived <laughs> in various places. We believe, actually, Anthony, my older son, was conceived in Scotland um, when <laughs> after I graduated. Uh, Anthony was born in Chicago, where I had my first appointment. Um, and indeed, as we travel across the country, Joyce was pregnant, and it didn't make for such a great trip. Um, and then Howard was born in, in uh, Minnesota just after we had moved there, and I had joined the University of Minnesota. 
So you wrote a thesis at Harvard. We're getting way ahead of ourselves. I'm sorry about that. No, <laughs> you wrote a thesis at Harvard. First you got to Harvard, and what happened then? Well, I, <laughs> okay. Um, one of the reasons I went to Harvard is that they gave me a fellowship, but that. also a research assistantship to work with Fred Mosteller. And the day after I arrived, I went into the department uh, because I didn't quite know what a research assistant did. And I went to see Fred, Professor Mosteller, of course. Uh, I didn't learn to call him Fred until later. And he was busy, but his assistant, Cleo Utes, uh, said he would like to have lunch with me. So I came back for lunch, and we went to the Harvard Faculty Club. And uh, Fred was being very courteous, and he suggested I ordered the horse steak, which was uh, a special item on the faculty club lunch. And the horse steak came. Uh, I'm not sure you've ever had horse steak. Uh, it's not quite like the kinds of steaks we normally <laughs> order. Uh, it's a little bit tougher, and so I, I cut my first piece of horse steak, I put it in my mouth, and I started to chew. And then Fred began to describe this problem to me. It was a problem about assessing probability assessors. And I didn't understand a thing, and he's talking away, and I'm chewing away. <laughs> and he asked me a question, and I'm chewing away. <laughs> And then he pulled an envelope out of his pocket. And on the back of it, there were these scribbles. And he handed it to me. And I'm still chewing away, because you really can't eat or steak except in very small bites. And the, there were notes from John Tukey about this problem. So it turned out that this was a problem that John and Fred were working on on some larger project. And my job was to translate the chicken scratches on the back of the envelope into something intelligible when I didn't know anything about what was going on. And I sort of worked at it for a while. Fred slowly told me what they meant. And uh, the key idea was uh, that for assessing probability forecasts, you have to look not just at the equivalent of means or bias, but also at variability. That was actually a very important lesson, although I didn't have any clue about it uh, in my first months at Harvard. I interrupted. <laughs> no, no, that's all right. I was, no, I wanted him to talk about Fred. I, you know, <laughs> Fred's been a very influential person in your career, not just during your thesis. Uh, maybe you want to uh, tell us a little bit more about how he influenced your life, and and also how how you came to go from Harvard to uh, Chicago. Well, I after that first year, I worked on several problems with Fred, and I wrote up some memos. Mm -hmm. They never quite moved into papers at the time. Um, but I, he was pretty busy. And I got interested in, in Bayesian inference. And at the time, Mark Dempster was the oh. person who seemed to be most involved in these things. And so I began to try to work with Art on uh, a problem that multivariate analysis problem. And I spent the better part of my second year doing that, and it didn't quite click. Uh, it actually led to a joint paper with George Chow, who was visiting from Wisconsin at the time in, um, at the business school. Uh, but it just didn't look like it was going to be a thesis problem. And then one summer, uh, the summer after that, Fred ran into me in the hall and said he had some problems maybe I'd like to work on. 
And uh, once they got going, uh, they became my thesis. And I got involved in other projects Fred did. I was his TA one year, uh, working with Fred and Kim Romney, uh, who was in the uh, social relations department at the time. Um, and then the time came to uh, get a job. And Fred said to me, where would you like to go? Um, things were different in those days, as <laughs> you will recall from your days at Chicago. And we went through the list of the best places in the field, at every one of which Fred had a friend. So he called up John Tukey at Princeton, he called up Eric Lehman at Berkeley, Lincoln Moses at Stanford, and Bill Kruskal at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I either got offers without showing up for different <laughs> kinds of jobs, or I got invited out. And I was invited out to the University of Chicago, and it just seemed a really neat place. All the faculty members were friendly. It was really cold. I came yeah. in January. <laughs> Uh, but I liked the architecture. It looked oh, like yeah. a university. Um, and Leo Goodman was there. Leo had done work that was directly tied to things that were in my thesis. It just seemed like a great place to go to. So I did. So it was, it was there that you first met Bill Kruskal and, and started being influenced by him or working I, with him? Bill Kruskal was the department chair at the time. And I barely got in the door. And he began getting me to talk about problems. Without that he was horse, without horse steak. He, he, would, he would just come and say, you know, what do you know about this? And, and one of the first topics we actually discussed was uh, political polls. This was the mm. summer of uh, 1968. There was a lot going on, and there was the Sun-Times straw poll that was showing up in the newspapers regularly. And the question was, how did, what was their methodology like? How accurate were the predictions? And I began to save the data and work on it. And Bill got me to do a series of television programs with Ken Pruitt and Norman Bradburn on a special series that aired at 6 o'clock in the morning where nobody ever looked. <laughs> uh, but it was right from the beginning. Uh, Bill and I interacted. He introduced me to Hans Zeisel in the law school. Mm -hmm. Uh, to uh, people in uh, the business school in sociology. It was really hard to trail after Bill because he was interested in everything in the university and outside. And um, that seemed pretty neat. So I tried to do something similar. Not like Bill, but <laughs> similar. Well, he was a really uh, a Renaissance man, and I presume you were a recipient of his many clippings from uh, newspapers. Journals. Well, the clippings started when I was in my first year. I mean, he, he's the one who started to give me the sometimes straw poll. But it wasn't just clippings. He would leave library books for me in my box. <laughs> He would go to the library, which was on the second floor of Eckerd Hall, the building we were in, and he'd browse. People don't do that today. The stacks are closed. <laughs> Bill would come back armed with books, and he'd share them with his colleagues and get Xeroxes of pages. And uh, this continued up through the 1980s. I would always get packets from uh, Bill of things. Uh, copies of letters to yes. somebody else saying, I hope you don't mind my sharing this <laughs> with a few of my closest friends and colleagues. And I had this image that he was making hundreds of Xeroxes to send around the world. And before that, carbon paper. <laughs> That's right. All right, so uh, <coughs> you um, tell us a bit about your life after Chicago. 
Well, Chicago really was a great place for me. Um, I, I, I had an, a second appointment in theoretical biology, which was sort of interesting because I never had a course in biology. And actually, it was a very informative experience because it taught me that I could go into an area that I had never studied, never learned, and learn enough to make a difference in application. So I wrote papers on uh, neural modeling, and I wrote mm. papers on um, ecology. I didn't do a lot of genetics, but I read genetics because I included that material in the course on stochastic processes that I taught. Um, but Chicago wasn't the safest of places in those days. And um, Joyce made it pretty clear that she wanted a place where our children could play in the backyard by themselves, not with supervision 100% of the time. And so I began to be receptive to conversations with people from the outside. And I was approached by one of my former students, Kinley Lawrence, who had just joined the University of Minnesota. And they were looking for a chair uh, as they were starting up the new Department of Applied Statistics. And so after four years at Chicago, I became an administrator. <laughs> Did you work with Seymour Geiser there? So the, the school was an interesting idea. that They had had a statistics department, and it had run into mm -hmm. some problems over the years. And they, they had this plan to reinvigorate statistics at the university. And they created the School of Statistics. Seymour was the director. And it was supposed to have three departments. There was the old department, now called the Department of Theoretical Statistics. There was the new department that I was chairing. And there was the biometry department mm. in the School of Public Health. But they didn't seem to want to have any part of this. Yeah. And so they resisted. And ultimately, the school had two departments, and we had the statistical center, the consulting center, which was associated with um, our department in St. Paul. Let, let me take you back a little more. You, you talked about these, these two giant figures who were colleagues and mentors, um, Fred Monsteller and Bill Kreskel. How, how do you see how they shaped your career, your interests? Not only technical, but practical. One of the things I didn't know as a graduate student was how easy it would be to do new things. The, the worst fear of a graduate student, well, mm. the f worst fear is they won't finish <laughs> the thesis. <laughs> Uh, the second fear is they won't have a new idea. And in fact, 80% of students never publish anything other than their thesis. Mm -hmm. But Fred was going from area to area. Yeah. He was, when I arrived, he did the Federalist papers with David Wallace. While I was there, there was the Halothane study. I worked with him evaluating uh, television rating uh, surveys from Nielsen and mm. other companies for a national network. That was a consulting problem. I, he just seemed to work round the clock mm. on all sorts of different things. And um, so I figured that's what a statistician did. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it, it's, it's funny because in some senses, clearly everybody didn't do this. But that was my model, and so when I got to Chicago and Bill did all that kind of stuff as well, <laughs> and yeah. Paul Meyer yes. in addition, uh, that seemed a natural way to do things. But working around the clock seemed to be part of 
what they did also. Now, Fred liked art. Um, in, in later years, he actually took mm. up reproducing art and it showed up in his office. But when I was a graduate student, I came into his office one day and there was a picture from Escher, the Dutch yeah. uh, artist. And I was very surprised because I had been introduced to Escher as an undergraduate. Um, Escher's work showed up on the cover of a book called Introduction to Geometry, uh, by, written by Donald Cox, a uh, great geometer at the University of Toronto, uh, with whom I had courses uh, somehow throughout my entire time at Toronto. So I had had these courses from Cox and I I'd learned some geometry. I still do some geometry that that is rooted in those days. But I learned about Escher. And there was this Escher print, and Fred told me where he got it, and we went off to the store, and I owned two Escher prints <laughs> as a consequence that I couldn't afford to have today yeah. uh, because of Fred. But we would go off to museums, we would talk about other things. They were Renaissance men, and I didn't know how I would do things like that. But it became very clear to me that just doing papers in the annals and in JASA, while I had colleagues whose careers looked like that, um, that wasn't necessarily what I thought I should do. And I got sucked into all these other activities, and everything was so much fun. <laughs> um, Dudley Duncan called me one day and asked me if I would join a committee um, in Washington. So I hadn't been to Washington since I had been a kid. And I went off to this meeting. It was an advisory committee set up by the Social Science Research Council mm -hmm. on social indicators. And I spent eight years interacting with giants in the field of sociology and survey methods. Um, and, and that just sort of added to all of this. Mm -hmm. And of course, Bill and Fred would just nudge me every once in a while <laughs> to get things done. In particular, Fred wanted to see the log linear model work appear in a book. Fred was yes. big on books. Mm -hmm. And um, as I left Harvard, he gathered together all the different students who had worked on different aspects of this, Yvonne Bishop, uh, Dick Light, uh, myself, Paul Holland, who was a junior faculty member. There were a couple of other faculty members who sort of disappeared by the wayside in this enterprise. There were a few more graduate students, Goodman Iverson, who ended up at Swarthmore. And he said, we need to have a book on this. Um, a year went by, and as I began to do my own research on topics that I hadn't done as a graduate student, the idea sort of came back to the fore, and Fred, behind the scenes, pushed the book. He served as our editor. He helped us think about organizing. He was always there pushing, and he didn't want his name on the cover of the book. So we had this back and forth. The, the, the book has five names on the title page. It's Yvonne Bishop, Steve Fein, Stephen Feinberg, <laughs> Paul Holland, with the collaboration of Frederick Mosteller and Dick Light. Dick mm. had contributed to one chapter in the book, and Fred had contributed to the whole enterprise. Mm. Well, one of the things that you have advanced in that book and, and elsewhere uh, derives from the geometric structure that gave you so much insight into what's going on to these tables. And you mentioned that uh, taking geometry at uh, Toronto, and, and, uh, but, and, and we know R.A. Fisher was influenced by this. How, how did that play out? In so later uh, it's, it's come into play in an amazing set of ways. If you look at the cover of Discrete Multivariate Analysis, there it is an artist's depiction 
of the surface of independence. You'd hardly know it was a hyperbolic paraboloid uh, right. sitting inside a tetrahedron <laughs> by the time the artist got done with it. Uh, and you see one dimension of rulings, a uh, hyperbolic paraboloid has two dimensions of essentially orthogonal rulings. And those were things I actually learned from Coxeter in that mm -hmm. uh, course on the introduction to geometry. Uh, and so my first work actually drew upon that. I wrote paper with John Gilbert and then generalized them. And I always thought geometrically. Don Fraser thought geometrically. And so you're always up here in some space, and he would always wave with his arns. And I think in n-dimensional space, in some sense, although obviously we don't see n-dimensional space, but a lot of statistics is projecting down into yes. lower dimensional spaces. And I had sort of left the geometry stuff behind except for motivation until I got into confidentiality problems in the 1990s. And there was a paper unpublished for five years by Percy Diaconis and Bern Sternfels. Um, Percy was at um, Cornell, and Bern had been at Cornell, but moved to Berkeley. <clears throat> and they talked about the algebraic geometry structure associated mm -hmm. with contingency tables. This turned out to be right at the heart of what I needed for my problem. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and so I learned algebraic geometry, which I had not really studied, at least enough to bring it to bear. One of the things I realized is that figure on the cover of Bishop Feinberg Holland had been rediscovered by algebraic geometers in a different context. So it's called a segre variety after an algebraic geometer. And that work now has affected the theses of a couple of my PhD students and is sort of at the heart of a lot of what I've been doing over the last several years, including recent work on algebraic statistics and network models. Mm -hmm. I think I derailed you some time back um, where you were talking about the, the trajectory <coughs> of your career. Um, and we've, we've left you at Minnesota. Um, you're not in Minnesota any longer. What happened? No, then? I went back to visit my <laughs> friends periodically. <laughs> Fair um, I, Minnesota was a giant bureaucracy. It was a big, Thanks, big university. university. And uh, one of the moments that sort of convinced me of this was after I had presented a report to the president and the uh, vice presidents on the teaching of statistics at the university and pointed out that 40 different departments were <laughs> teaching something. This wasn't just me. This was a collection of people not in statistics, and I was representing statistics that there were 40 units teaching statistics that represented a serious part of the activity, but with little or no coordination with the school and uh, our offerings. And then I met him about a month later at a reception. We were going to the reception line, and I shook his hand, and he asked what department I was from, and I said, applied statistics. And he said, do we have a statistics department at the <laughs> University of Minnesota? And I said, oh, my goodness. And so I understood where we stood in the big picture of the university. And I had friends at other places. Uh, I was wooed uh, at another Big Ten university. It didn't quite come to pass. But in the mid-'70s, I. Uh, was working uh, as an associate editor for the Journal of the American Statistical Association, initially with Brad Efren as editor, and then um, with Maury DeGroote. And later I became um, applications 
and coordinating editor of JASA, and Maury and I worked together. We had become friends uh, a number of years earlier, uh, drinking in a bar together uh, at, a, at a regional meeting. And Maury and Jay Cadane, who had joined the department in the early 70s, and I would interact at uh, Bayesian meetings that Arnold Zellner organized twice a year. Uh, and they knew that I had dabbled with the possibility of leaving. And they said, oh, you should just come to Carnegie Mellon. You could bring the rest of JASA. Uh, over and we'd have the whole journal, uh, uh, but it's a great place. So um, they worked on the possibility of an appointment, and um, I came. And it wasn't just meeting with the dean and uh, with Jay and Maury and the people in the department who I knew. They took me to see the president. President of Carnegie Mellon at the time was Dick Sire. Dick was a statistician. He took courses from Hotelling and Cochran at Columbia. And although his degree was in economics, he always thought that he was a statistician as well. He was a member of, and fellow of ASA. And uh, Dick helped found the department when he was dean of the Graduate School of Industrial Administration. And he was actually the acting chair first. And so uh, they ushered me into his office. I had never met Dick. And I spent two hours with the president. Now, I told you about my interaction with the president of the University of Minnesota. <laughs> and here I am sitting with the president of this great university. And he's telling me how important it is for me to come to Carnegie Mellon and what I'm going to do for the field of statistics. And he said, if you come here, everything you do will be called statistics. You will get to change the field. So I came. And I hope that I've changed parts of the field. Sire <laughs> yeah. was a, a visionary and um, really led the uh, Graduate School of Industrial Administration to, uh, to a high place in uh, among business schools and uh, understood you needed quantitative strength and so pleased he, he influenced you and, and supported you. I wanted to ask uh, about one of your greatest honors and that's election to the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, where were you and how did you get the word? Uh, most people don't know what goes on. <clears throat> this is like a secret society. Yes. <laughs> There's a very Byzantine selection process <clears throat> and then the members meet in Washington at the annual meeting, in a business meeting, and they elect the new members. That happens between 8.30 and 9 in the morning. And then they take a break in the meeting, and everybody rushes out to find uh, a f telephone, and they call their friends or the newly elected members from their section. So I was teaching, um, actually that year I was teaching an introductory statistics class, so I had to be there relatively <laughs> early. And it was just at 9 o'clock, <clears throat> I was opening the door to my office, and the phone rang. And it was several friends. Uh, mainly demographers, Jane Mencken, mm -hmm. Doug Massey, and a couple of other people. And there was a chorus on the phone saying, congratulations, <laughs> you've been elected to the National Academy. And I was floored uh, because I'm not quite sure what they knew, but I knew that a year or so earlier I wouldn't have been eligible because I was born and raised in Canada, and I hadn't become an American citizen until uh, January of 1998. So they would have kicked me out of the process the year <laughs> <Really> before <laughs> because I wasn't eligible for election. And um, so it was a special honor. You, you've been active in several committees and panels and so forth in the National Academy. 
before and after your election as a member. Um, what, what stands out particularly well, from that? Of course, this is Bill Kreskel at work, <laughs> in case uh, um, the people who are going to watch this don't know. Um, Bill Kreskel uh, founded the Committee on National Statistics. It was an outgrowth of the 1971 President's Commission report, and he went and he talked the people at the National Academies into creating a committee where there was no funding, where they really had to put up resources. He ultimately got some money from the Russell That's Sage right. Foundation to tide the committee over with a part-time staffer, uh, Margaret Martin, who was absolutely fabulous and with whom we've all uh, worked. And um, the committee slowly got going. Um, Bill was succeeded by Con Teuber. At that time, I actually got into a committee on the rehabilitation of criminal offenders. But uh, Myron was uh, working for the committee by that time. And so I would run into him. and. Um, I got to join the committee a year or so later while I was still doing this other work. And it was sort of like all these other things. It was like being a kid in a candy shop. The committee didn't have a lot of projects then. But I just got to look around the academy and the federal government and there were possibilities everywhere. And so I could only do so much, but I pushed the staff to do other things and got my friends on the committee to lead panels. And by the mid-80s, the committee was humming and there were all these neat activities on, um, on census methodology, on cognitive aspects of survey methodology, statistical assessments as evidence in the courts, sharing research data, there was just no end. I wanted to ask about one of them in particular, which Judy uh, uh, chaired, and you were instrumental in, and, and that is cognitive aspects of survey methodology. When you were inducted into the American Academy of Political and Social uh, Sciences, you referred to that in your speech uh, as one of the most important activities you participated in. Why, why was this, and how, how did it affect your work? Well. Sample surveys is a very strange part of statistics. If you came to my department, nobody else does it in the research sense. The people think the theory is settled, but doing surveys is really hard. The measurement problems are enormous. Designing questionnaires is a big, big problem. In the 70s, I got into the National Crime Survey on victimization uh, through the SSRC committee in Washington mm -hmm. that I was involved with. And I learned about the difficulties uh, in counting victimization events. And in 1980, Al Bitterman, uh, who was involved in the redesign effort, brought together a few people from the redesign project with cognitive psychologists to ask if we could learn something from cognitive science. And I thought this was just terrific because I could see ways that I could take methodological ideas and really intertwine them with the theoretical ideas that came out of cognitive psychology. And so th I pushed for that activity. I was part of the workshop. Uh, Judy and Beth Loftus and I wrote a series of four papers mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, I was on the SSRC Council, and we created a committee that followed up on those activities. It brought in new people. It helped get these ideas embedded in the statistical agencies. Janet Norwood uh, ran with it at BLS. Uh, uh, it was 
it, it was part of the culture at NCHS already at that time? Because of Monroe Serkin. Because Monroe Serkin was at the workshop. Census was actually the last of the big three mm -hmm. to, to, to create a separate laboratory facility, uh, but they did. And um, the influence spread because it changed research at the boundaries in a variety of different ways. And the reason I, I, I like this is because you'd hardly know that there was any theory or methods lurking behind it, but there really was. Mm -hmm. It's really had a profound effect on, on the survey field, and, and now as many places as commonplace, uh, yeah. concepts of cognitive interviewing and the like. Um, You've been especially close to your students, fostering them personally as well as professionally. Pictures of you attending weddings of your students uh, appear on websites in your honor. Uh, and so could you tell us a little bit about the adventures you've had with, with students well, in, of personal nature? It, in the early years, the students were my contemporaries. And in fact, I had a couple of students who were older than I was. So. Um, Kinley Lawrence was not only my PhD student collaborator, we were mm -hmm. good friends, and still are. Um, over the years, I got a little older than my students. Um, and when I moved to Carnegie Mellon, I really had the opportunity to have a different kind of student. It's hard to describe the difference. Uh, and each of the students I worked with then was uh, interested in somewhat different things. They went in different directions, and and so I I went through it. But something happened. I I left Carnegie Mellon, mm -hmm. as you know. Um, I had a second career going on on the side. I had three careers. <laughs> Uh, or four. <laughs> there was the committee work uh, at, at the National Academy, which was a full-time job for a while. There was what I did at, um, uh, in the department, in my methodology, in the Department of Statistics. I was also an administrator. I was department head for three mm -hmm. years, and then I was dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. And I was on an administrative track at the time. And so I, my contact with graduate students actually tailed off mm. toward the end of my time as dean. I was teaching, but you, there's only so many hours in the day. And I left and went to the York University in Toronto as academic vice president. That's like a provost. Uh, they don't have that title there. Uh, and so my ties were sort of severed. I had resigned, although we didn't sell our house. <laughs> and then I came back a few years later and joined the department. I like to describe it as a promotion to the best position in the university. Professor <laughs> with no obligations. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I slowly began to work with graduate students again. And somewhere along the way, I think I had learned something, uh, which is you can't get graduate students to do what you want. And so what you have to do is get them to do what they do best. You have to get them done, but you have to be able to get them through and have them gain confidence in what they're doing so that they think they can make a difference. And I was lucky. I just had fabulous students. They were terrific people. And all that rest of the stuff just sort of happened. So uh, I had uh, the opportunity to give away uh, one of my students, Stella, who was working in Spain uh, in uh, the mayor's office in Bilbao because her father had had a heart attack and couldn't come to okay. the wedding. And um, they're terrific people and it's 
the best thing I can do in some sense is get them to do the things that they do best and that's in many ways a serious part of my legacy. I, I, was, I was going to ask you what, what advice you would have for graduate students in statistics or undergraduates for that matter. Clearly the, the best advice I can think of for you to give is to come be your student, but <laughs> since you can't spread yourself totally thin, um, <laughs> failing that, what would be an advice you'd well, offer? It's really bad because we've now got this undergraduate program with 125 majors and uh, I can't deal with that. <laughs> I can deal with one or two, but um, um, statistics is an exciting field. There are all these neat problems, there's neat theory, there's neat methods. We're in a new world, big, big data sets. My joint appointment now is in machine learning. I'm working on data sets that people couldn't conceive of dealing with a few years ago. And the students I get to work with have the ability to go in and do things with those data sets that were unimaginable uh, a decade ago. work with data, take problems seriously, but you have to learn the mathematics and theory if you want to do them right. And then teaching people what you've done, not just doing it, getting the description so that other people can understand, that's a really mm -hmm. important part of what we do. That's what academy reports are about. Academy reports don't have impact if they're badly written. And so enormous effort goes into the executive summaries and to the review process and everything up the line. And learning how to do that as a student is the time to start. Mm -hmm. It's too late when you're a full professor <laughs> And you still haven't learned to write articles so that other people can understand what you've done. Habits are already formed. So uh, of your vast experiences, uh, what are you most proudest of, most proud of? I, I'm actually proud of a number of things. Well, I, by the way, I didn't tell you what my fourth career was. Oh. I play ice hockey. Ah. <laughs> so I still play. That's number one. <laughs> um, All right, let as, me interrupt as, you. <laughs> no, no, no. As, as, as I left the locker room last Saturday night, one of the guys across the, the dressing room said to me, so how many years have you been playing? <laughs> and I said, 62. <laughs> And he said, 62. <laughs> but number two is my kids and my grandchildren. They're really amazing. They're, they're another part yeah. of my life. Um, we were really fortunate. I have two very smart sons, Anthony and Howard. They have independent careers. They have lovely wives. Where are they now? Uh, Anthony lives in Paris, and I have three granddaughters in Paris with two more grandchildren on the way. Yes. <laughs> and I have a lovely granddaughter in Vienna, Virginia, <laughs> which is where Howard lives. And uh, he actually has come very close to statistics. Yes. as a government liaison for a consortium dealing with surveys and marketing. Um, and um, they're terrific. Uh, I love being with them. We get to look after them every once in a while. Then there's my students. Mm. They're really the people who are going to do the things that I can only imagine. And then as I look back over what I've done, 
what I see is Fred Mosteller and Bill Kruskal were fabulous. And as we talked about here, uh, they shaped, in fact, our careers, uh, not just my career. But they never changed totally the departments they were in and what those departments taught their students mm -hmm. and what they required. I'd like to think that when I left Chicago and went to Minnesota, I started to change what statistics did and how we thought about mm -hmm. it. And applications today sit at the core of much of the theory and methods. And in my department at Carnegie Mellon, our students come out having worked on multiple applied projects, and they're in demand because that's the future of our field. People recognize that statistical it, advances in statistical methods and theory are intertwined with real problems, major applications. And I like to think that I contributed to that change that we've seen over this period of time. Uh, very nice, Steve. I mean, it's, it's, uh, what you talk about is a legacy, not, not the individual research that may wane in And it's not over just my work. And that's, uh, that's it's right. It's a but collective. It, but it's the influence through students as well as your children uh, and the like. I, I wanted to interrupt because I never thought you had four careers. I thought you had dozens of careers. <laughs> uh, you talked about these professors that, uh, you know, work 24-7, so that was your model. Uh, as long as I've known you, um, I mean, you're always multitasking, and you were doing that before the word was even in vogue. <laughs> Whether you're fielding questions at a seminar or a flying hockey puck across an ice rink, did any of that rub off <laughs> on, on your sons, on, on your students? Uh, I don't think that. Howard is quite as obsessed <laughs> as I am with things. How fortunate. But I, I, that's right. He gets, but they have these terrific kids. <laughs> and so, uh, Anthony is at some level. He's, he's created his own business mm. in, in France. And, you know, it was, it was from finding the location to have the offices, to hiring the staff, to uh, inventing the insurance policies and making sure that they were consistent with the ones of his parent company. And, uh, I tell my students when they come in and uh, ask if they can work with me that there are a couple of things that are going to happen if it's going to succeed. One is they're going to live and breathe statistics. I see it everywhere. One of my favorite examples in uh, my little contingency table book came out of the program from the symphony at, at the Minneapolis Orchestra one night when we were there. <laughs> it didn't quite look like a contingency table, but I made it into one. And then I described why you shouldn't analyze it the way you would have other ones. I tell them that I expect them to live and breathe it. They'll get their ideas in the shower. They'll, they'll play hard, too. But when all is said and done, if they're not into what they're doing, they should find another advisor, because other people have different attitudes about things. And some of them actually <laughs> do that. And uh, they, of course, have their own lives. And as I said, I've learned that you don't tell students what to do, they tell you what to do. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. next for you? Wow. I'm too busy at the moment <laughs> to stop and find out. Um, I still have more than one job. Um, I'm editing with some others, the Annals of Applied Statistics. I'm co-chair of the Report Review Committee at the Academy. I have a whole bunch of new PhD students. We've got some 
absolutely fantastic projects going on on confidentiality problems yes. and on network modeling, which, by the way, links to confidentiality. Uh, I, I'm hoping a student will develop that as a thesis problem. But we have a book to write, that would be nice. <laughs> as Fred Mostelli would say. We, I have six chapters that were, I thought, pretty polished at one stage, still in a drawer. I know where the drawer is. And I know where my copies are. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I've got more books to write, too, uh, with good collaborators. <laughs> okay. Well, we're almost out of time, but I have one final question. How would you like to be remembered, Steve? as a great hockey player, which I'm not. <laughs> uh, they just let me on the ice and I'm happy. Um, I guess I'd like to be remembered as somebody who produced really good students and who helped change the image of statistics. Yes. in the sense that lots of people now work on serious applied problems and help solve them. And that's not just statistics. That's real interdisciplinary scientific work. And that's the legacy I inherited from Fred and Bill Kruskal and Paul Meyer, all the great people I had a chance to work with. Bill Cochran. And I would just like for people to think of me in that kind of company in just some way or another. I suspect that a couple of decades from now, if anybody ever looks at this video, they may not remember log linear models because there'll be new methodology. Um, what I know from students today is if it wasn't in the journal in the last three years, they're not sure it's worth their attention. So it's this other larger thing. I have no theorems. Well, I do have theorems, but none of them are named Feinberg's theorem. <laughs> and um, they wouldn't be important. What's important is the attitude for what statistics is and how it's recognized by other people. Well, you've changed statistics, and you've made it fun mm -hmm. along the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.